Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. We are lucky today to have Dr. Lohr, the most famous lung transplant surgeon on the planet. And I just heard, well, okay, maybe not. <laughs> That's in my opinion. Yeah, no, no, most famous that. one in my office. Thank you. So I just heard unbelievably that you just did your 100th lung transplant. Yeah, yeah, we did for the uh, what we consider our, our fiscal year, what we plan for, what we budget for. So from June to June, uh, we we did uh, last year. We had had 57 during that same interval. So it, it is a it's a gauge of the health of the program. So we expect to finish the calendar year pretty pretty strong. Over a hundred. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, I remember yeah. when we were doing 14. Yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. and yeah. and in, in that level, you're one of the busiest programs in the country. Yeah, uh, no, definitely. It's uh, uh, obviously it's a, co a collective effort. Um, I, you know, I bring in some uh, unique perspectives, I think, from from training and from mentors that I've had over the years, uh, indebted to Ken McCurry, yes to Pedersen, so from Cleveland from, from back then. Yeah, who cares um, about them? But, I'm, 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 <laughs> yeah. It's all you. Yeah, and then, and then a lot of things evolve, and, and the field has changed a lot since when I started in it, over a decade. So uh, tell me a little bit about the kinds of patients you get, because that has changed a lot. It has. So um, it's end-stage lung disease, irreversible lung disease is uh, the, the larger bucket, and then that's that services a lot of different patients. So it started off with cystic fibrosis, yeah. um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis has always been pretty high on the list. COPD has always right. been there. Um, and then, um, and then uh, and a variety of pulmonary hypertension and other patients who've had. So I didn't realize you were doing transplants for pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, we try to treat them medically as long as possible, but, uh, but transplant is a great option uh, for them if they don't have any reversible uh, methods or if they don't qualify for pulmonary endarterectomy, which is right, another right, thing right. that we offer. Um, but then over the years, that's changed a lot because there's been a great medicine now, after for, for cystic fibrosis. So it's changed the landscape. So we do still Still get patients with cystic fibrosis, but they're usually either retransplants or patients who are older. Um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is still the most common mm -hmm. indication that we still have. Um, and then we had a whole slew of patients with COVID that we had to oh, to, right. to also right. transplant. And, you, and, and that was controversial for a while, wasn't it? I mean, so it was. Yeah. So it was it was unclear whether there would be a benefit, whether if you put them on immunosuppression afterwards, if that was going to be a bad idea. Right. Uh, it turned out to work actually really well. Our series here, we had 100 percent survival. We did uh, some of the most in the country for a single center. We did uh, 15, 16 of them uh, pretty straight. Uh, and, and that were on ECMO. We did others that were not on ECMO, right. so they were the, so the sickest. ECMO? Tell people yeah. that. So ECMO is a form of, of advanced heart and lung support that provides oxygen directly into the blood. Um, that was not uncommon for patients that were pres that presented with COVID. So the, many of them could be managed on the ventilator, but a lot of them needed advanced support with the ECMO. And those are exactly the ones that were also being considered for transplant. Right. So um, so we had to deal with that, and we learned a lot from that. So, so let me ask you, because it's interesting to me that of the organs that are transplantable, lung was one of the hardest. Yeah. Why is that? Well, um, I think that there were some technical uh, aspects of it about how do you get the airways to heal, it's cartilage to cartilage. Um, and and while we have evolved in that aspect, we know that we can't uh, just anastomose the trachea. That used to be the earlier way to do it. They would do the trachea, but not a lot of collateral flow unless you do the bronchial artery. That added a lot of complexity that w it was just you know, one or two people that were, that were uh, doing the bronchial artery. So then they went back to going into the main airways, which was a lot more user-friendly and it allowed transplant numbers to increase substantially with less airway complications. So that was one of the early hurdles, um, some issues with understanding how to align the veins and the arteries. But once that was all in, is set up, then it became a matter of, of uh, patient selection uh, and who was going to do okay with a surgery of that magnitude and then to be on immunosuppression afterwards. Yeah, and there's a... There's a <laughs> I don't think people realize there's a lot of immune cells in the lung. Yes. And yes. that's another issue for rejection. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah the, 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 sure. So it's interesting. We see that in the lab where we filter out the blood that we're using, mm -hmm. but then, but so there's no white cells. But then when you put the donor lung in a device, you see white cells gradually start to right. come up. So, yeah. well, and speaking of devices, so <laughs> you're one of the pioneers in, 
in how to keep the lungs preserved. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, we, we were very, very early adopters of this. Uh, it was over a decade ago. Uh, the concept is called ex vivo lung perfusion or EVLP. Um, and it's it's a concept of, of monitoring and assessing a donor organ of any kind, but in this case being lung, um, outside of the body before it's implanted into the patient. And it, it started off as a monitoring tool mostly to screen out uh, patients who died of a heart attack or who had some other unconventional uh, situations where you wanted to evaluate the organ before implanting right. it. But then it evolved into a portable device that allowed you to actually extend your your uh, uh, transportation time substantially because right. it's getting blood pumping through it um, and draining and ventilation, oxygen throughout. So it's like the lung is actually being ventilated yeah. in a box. Yeah, definitely. It's a little ICU. A little um, creepy, but very cool. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. It, it's, uh, it's, it's really uh, amazing. I mean, there's no question that the engineering of it, to make it portable like that yeah, is yeah. is really sophisticated. Uh, we we went through, uh, and I was proud to be a part of this early on, is went through a lot of uh, clinical trials behind it. The randomized, largest randomized clinical trial that was ever done in transplant, um, which was compare 150 patients with and without it uh, to show it was safe. So not uh, in the box or in the box. Exactly. Exactly. Um, early, and what were the results? So, <laughs> so they were interestingly they were the most standard of donors. So hard to tell major differences because right. the outcome they were you know donors that were not far it was fairly standard. So the survival outcomes were fairly comparable actually. Right. So it questioned well well you know to what degree do you need to use it? But we saw a lot of interesting signals early on. We saw less reperfusion injury, and it kind of made sense because you had less ischemia. Right. Um, right. They they didn't they never really were ischemic. Um, so. So then lack of blood flow. Lack of blood flow. Yeah. So so they had blood pumping through them the whole time. So then they didn't have that phenomenon that happens when they get a gradual intro right. reintroduction of blood flow, um, kind of like a heart attack. They don't get that stunning effect. Um, so that was very interesting. And then we went into a what was a single arm study. We couldn't randomize because it was looking at the more extended criteria donors. So what that means is, and now it's not that extended anymore, but, but what it means is donors at the time that were older than, than 55, which, which now is quite common, and uh, donors that had donation after the, the cardiac death, so the heart had already arrested, um, smoking history, uh, donors of longer than six hours. So several features that were, were clearly were lungs that were not being yeah, used. Yeah. Um, so we tested them in this single arm multi-center international trial and found a, a excellent survival. So this uh, expands the numbers of organs that exactly. are available, which is yeah. always the limiting Absolutely. factor. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so you know, the other thing that uh, you're amazing about uh, <laughs> is that you did actually dual organ transplant. Yes. That's got to be technically challenging, especially above and below the diaphragm. How, yeah. how did you manage that? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that that is the the quintessential example of a collaborative environment. So that's uh, I look at it kind of like a relay race. So you have to do your your part of the race just has to be like perfect. Cause then you have to hand off the ban the baton to your partner. Yeah, and and so we're we're thankful here that we've got Dr. Goss, who's one of the the world's uh, leading, if not best, liver transplant surgeon and his team. So um, it's definitely not hard to contemplate being able to combine the two forces. We've had very good outcomes and results with them. That's a so, yeah. the, the, the complexity of that operation. How long, <laughs> how long does it take? Was it like six, so, uh, seven hours? Yeah, so it definitely takes, it gives us about like the three to four hours on the lung side and then the side on the on the liver. And it one of the, the things that it's brought to question is how we conduct the lung transplant operation mm -hmm. because certain things that we were used to doing, like using cardiopulmonary bypass, which right. we use for heart surgery, was not good for the liver. Um, and so we learned how to do them without any support or with wow. just a little bit of support, like with ECMO. Uh, and then that made the liver be much more stable, a, a much, much more uh, easier uh, process afterwards. And then we, we've actually applied that to uh, and studied it, and we've applied it now to, to really all of our transplants. Well, I just want to thank you. I mean, yeah. I, I honestly, I, I'm amazed that you've done that many. Yeah. The outcomes are awesome, and uh, it's such a great thing for patients and, and for our program. Because, I, in my view, we have the best transplant program in the country, so Indeed. I don't care what you think. It's my view. <laughs> I agree. I'm yeah. going with it. Anyways, thank you so much for giving us time. Thank you Great so to much. see you. Oh, thank thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lohr, for that great presentation and the wonderful time to have a conversation with you. And I want to end this week with a bunch of shout-outs. First of all, congratulations to the Baylor Graduate Student Mentor Pair 
uh, Brittany Jones and Dr. Indira Meiserecker, the Department of Medicine, uh, who received one of the 2024 Howard Hughes Medical Institute Gillum uh, uh, Fellowships. These fellowships recognize their outstanding research and commitment to advancing inclusion in science. The 50 student advisor pairs are selected from more than 700 applicants from 43 institutions. I also want to congratulate Dr. James Lupsky, uh, the Professor of Molecular and Human Genetics, who received the Gilded P Award from the European Society of Human Genetics. This award recognizes his lifelong contributions to the field of human genetics, and the award symbolizes the revolutionary work of Gregor Mendel, who conducted his experiments with pea plants in the 1800s. And of course, August, is, besides being hot, is back to school time for K through 12 and college students. Be sure to make sure your kids are up to date on all their vaccines. Uh, the 2024 flu and COVID vaccines will be available at the end of August and early September. Uh, those of you sending kids off to college, uh, please remind them of the importance of these vaccines. Uh, these viruses spread very quickly in dormitories and you want to protect your children. So have a wonderful weekend and I can't wait to see you next week.